чисто здесь прямо я понимаю Так, проверка звука. Mic check. Проверка звука. One, two, three. Раз, One, two, three. Раз, два, Звук три. нормально? Нормально. Все окей? Прекрасно. Окей. Отлично. Uh, вот, uh, надо так сказать, ребята, мы, мы будем вот на английском и на русском, so, да? We are going to speak both uh, English вот in я могу вам конкретно сказать, что вот uh, переводчики наши, которые там работают, просто молодые, они золотые. Если хотите, uh, пожалуйста, like, идите вот там uh, назад и вот to the back and uh, get uh, the earpiece uh, being for the simultaneous interpretation because, no, uh, well, our panel is, uh, is experts highly auspicious and highly intelligent and, and uh, I'm really looking forward to what so, they have to say. So, uh, I'm going to ask you two minutes of housekeeping. Um, I'll introduce you to the panel. We will have six, six presentations. С вами будет где-то 5 или 6, 6 презентаций, которые будут Марко Василий, Мария, Юрий, Эдуард. И затем мы заслушаем... Uh, binary District, the international community that provides courses, lectures, and conferences on new tech such as AI, blockchain, machine learning, neuronet, cybersecurity, virtual reality, and big data for business professionals. Their aim is to provide, to, to combine innovative tech, best practice with valuable experience exchange for professionals in public. The Strelka Institute, which most of you will know, uh, our host, which is a non-commercial educational institute established in 2009 to change the landscape of Russian cities. Changes start with people, and that's why all programs and projects of Strelka have, educated, have an educational factor that lead to the development of human capital. Uh, the general partner is the Vostok project, which is a worldwide multi-use blockchain for government agencies and business enterprises. Uh, the new platform is unique. Is, it's being implemented in Russia with advanced cryptographic algorithms. The new project launched in April 2018 by Waves contains two very important elements, the system itself and a new platforms integrator to enable it to be compatible with other platforms. Vostok's purpose is to build a blockchain mainframe for the certification, registration and tracking of all data and to make blockchain technology simple to use in business and public admin. Now today is the last day of the conference which has been convened to support the state program Digital Economies of the Russian Federation 2024. So, I guess there's going to be a theme about the future and what's going to come next. Uh, but support here doesn't necessarily mean we blindly accept what's being proposed. Uh, we're here to discuss and critique possible solutions uh, for the Russian economy, but also internationally. And as you can see, we have a great uh, mix of highly experienced uh, Russian practitioners and internationally based uh, geniuses, basically. Most of them have PhDs. Um, that's why Strelka and Binary District, as the center of everything, is connected to city development and technologies, and that's why they invited this panel to come together. So over the last two days, the conference has covered infrastructure, human resources, and education in advanced technologies. 
uh, all of those previous uh, sessions are online on the Strelka Facebook page, for example. You can watch them, and they're excellent. Uh, but now it's time to talk about how to protect these technologies, the infrastructure, and citizens, perhaps, from themselves. So some of the themes you'll probably know about uh, already, but we'll look at kind of you know, some concrete examples from the Russian economy of, of uh, information leaks, cybersecurity incidents, uh, and some brilliant ideas and proposals from our international panel uh, who can bring some international best practice and concepts to the, uh, to the discussion. Uh, so let me just introduce you to the panel very quickly. Uh, we'll start with Edward Fos Villaronga, uh, PhD, MA, LLM, LLB, uh, who's uh, uh, from, uh, from Catalonia um, and is the Microsoft Cloud Computing Research Center uh, and the Center for Commercial Law Studies at Queen Mary University of London, United Kingdom. Uh, but he's just told me he's been awarded a Marie Curie Fellowship to work in uh, Leiden in the, uh, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, Keren Elazare is a senior researcher with the Blavatnik Interdisciplinary Cyber Research Center uh, at the, and the Security and Technology Workshop at Tel Aviv University. She's an author and speaker on cybersecurity and hacker culture. In 2014, Karen became the first Israeli woman to give a TED Talk. 2014? It's late. Wow, it's great. Congratulations. Uh, Professor Dr. Marco Gerke, uh, Director of Cybercrime Research Institute, an international expert in the field of law related to cybercrime, cybersecurity, and ICT. Has for more than 10 years advised governments and international organizations. Maria Voronova, uh, Director po Consultatinge, Vedushi Expert po Informazioni Bezapasnest at InfoWatch. Uh, Dmitry Samartsov, who is the Director of Bizone. Dmitry Samartsov. Uh, it's created by Sperbank and part of the Greater Sperbank ecosystem and the uh, digital innovation ecosystem. Uh, and Yuri Namestnikov uh, from uh, Kaspersky Lab. And last but not least, uh, Vasi Vasily uh, Lukinik, who is uh, the Director of Strategic Development at Ross Telecom Solar. Uh, Solar, uh, as you probably know, uh, was a cybersecurity company that was purchased uh, recently uh, by the, uh, the giant um, digital uh, communications uh, group Ross Telecom. So, uh, this is the fascinating panel. Our structure today is to go through some presentations that the guys uh, have brought with them. These presentations will start, uh, will start with Marco, who will talk to you about the kind of global uh, and uh, general uh, level. And then uh, the guys will talk a little about the Russian market. Karen's going to speak to you about hackers and why you shouldn't be afraid of them. Uh, or maybe you should. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Maria will speak uh, uh, about the, uh, the Russian market and Yuri will, will also speak about his experience with Kaspersky before we can open it up to a panel where we will welcome all of your questions. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it and I look forward to hearing from your questions a bit later on. Uh, and allow me to uh, open the session by introducing you to Marco. Thank you, Marco. Thank you very much for the nice opening. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. As you can see, I have a pretty analog presentation for you. Um, topic of the presentation and the whole panel today is, is cybersecurity. And I guess a lot of people will have the expectation that when we're speaking about cybersecurity, we should first of all talk about how bad things are. Uh, they're getting worse every day. Uh, there are more threats. Uh, the damages is increasing. Uh, the capacities of the offender is increasing. And, and this is usually what you hear at those conferences. I believe that the security industry did not really do themselves a favor by using this approach, by scaring people and telling them how bad things are. So therefore, I would like to start completely different and first of all, like to talk about what is the broader topic of those conference series, which is digitalization and the advantages of security, uh, sorry, the advantages of technology. Um, so I'd like to speak about some of the things that are going on that you've certainly already witnessed um, and that are fascinating components of our time. So we see a lot of different technical developments, each unique in their field. Um, when you're looking back a couple of years, one of the hot topics on those digital events was big data. Uh, collecting a lot of data, trying to analyze it, trying to draw a conclusion from it. That's a fascinating development that is continuing. 
it is not only continuing because of itself, but because we can combine it with other technical developments. I'll give you an example, Internet of Things allows us to introduce sensors that are collecting data themselves. We don't need to collect the data ourselves and put it into a big data database, but we can have machines collecting data for us. And the more data we can collect, the more conclusions we can try to draw. So these are already two fascinating developments that were taking place at the same time. And there are more. You heard it in the introduction when uh, there was a short overview about the topics that are covered by the Institute. There are other things like, for example, artificial intelligence and machine learning. These are developments that are taking place in the last years that were unthinkable before. When I founded a computer company at the end of the 1980s and I wrote the algorithms that we were using, where we're using machine learning to detect diseases before a doctor would be able to detect diseases, well, we were not even dreaming about what is possible today. We thought it is impossible. I had no idea that in 2018 we're at a at a situation where we can use technology that is freely available on the market, uh, that was this kind of technology that is available in the, in the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence today was unthinkable before. So we can use, we can now start combining those technologies. We can combine big data with Internet of Things, I mentioned this, and then we can use artificial intelligence and machine learning to make more use of the data, to make sense of the data that we're collecting. And this continues. There are even more developments that are usually only seen as individual developments, but they're all part of a bigger picture. So you can, for example, look into what is happening in the computer field. Quantum computing is one of the next big things. It's something that is happening already, but that will have major implications for the future because of a lot of operations that are impossible right now, that we can just simply not go through because our computer power is not strong enough. Well, quantum computing will probably solve some of those problems. Um, and we could continue the list on and on. We could speak about blockchain, which is a technology that you can put on top of everything and can say, well, we want to make things more transparent. All of these components actually are moving closer together. We can combine all of this. We can use uh, quantum computing to run very complex algorithms and make sense of big data and all of this is under the umbrella of blockchain for example so i would like to encourage people to to think about this and see it as an opportunity and not think about cybersecurity or the challenges related to this as something that would stop us from using any of this technology it is fascinating what we can do and we should see the positive side however this is now a panel about data security and cybersecurity so it would be at the same time completely wrong not to touch upon the topic of security. Security is one component. Um, being an expert in this field, I might personally wish it is the most important topic, but I can guarantee you it is not. There are way more important topics than cybersecurity. But cybersecurity is relevant, and you will not want to use this kind of technology. You wanna, don't want to implement this kind of technology without having security measures in place. So therefore, we need to think about it. The question is, um, what should be our approach? How should we approach cybersecurity? And um, I believe this is an, an approach where you cannot come up with this one solution. Cybersecurity should be something that we're dealing with by design. So there is a responsibility on the side of the industry to say, are there security measures that we can implement right from the beginning to make life more easy? Um, this is actually happening, and the security field is failing on talking about this frequently enough. They should say proudly what kind of technology they're using and how much progress they made in certain fields. It will not solve the problem of cyber attacks. It will not be the end of cyber attacks, but there is a lot of things that can be done through a technical level. But technology is not the only thing. Um, we also need education of people. Uh, we know that one of the weakest points these days is the person sitting in front of the computer system as he's making mistakes. Um, we can try to do this. We can try to merge it with technology and say, okay, if that person fails, technology should kick in and should stop him from doing risky behavior or at least make him aware that he's undertaking risky behavior. Uh, but even that is not everything. Very often people are calling on governments or, or lawyers and say, can't you fix it with a law? And uh, as a law professor, again, I would like to tell you, yes, the answer is legislation. Let's come up with more legislation. But it is not. I can tell you I helped many countries to introduce cybercrime legislation and cybersecurity legislation and policies. 
but this is a piece of paper. If you don't implement it, if you don't have follow-up, if you don't have institutional capacities to follow up with concrete measures, it means nothing. And no law in general will stop all kind of criminal activities. Some people will say, okay, I respect the law. Others will say, I ignore the law. And we cannot solve the problem alone by this measure. So we need to look into different fields of our society to see who can play which role. And ultimately, we have to be very honest. It is up to the people and up to the institutions, up to companies that are using this kind of technology to play a responsible role and think, how can I personally participate in securing the services, either for myself or for the people? I would like, at the end of my short introduction, I would like to highlight three areas that are in the focus of a lot of decision makers right now. One of the privileges of my work is that I can work with a lot of governments around the world, a lot of times on the ministerial level, so I'm talking to ministers about this topic, and they're asking me for my view and, and, and say, where do you see the major threats? And I would like to summarize in just very, very few examples where we see major threats. So one of the, the first areas we see threats is, of course, in technical development. When we're talking about when governments are approaching me and, and they say, how can we find out if we are ready for the new digital economy? I'm usually now asking them, what's your quantum computing strategy? And a lot of them are looking at me and saying, what do you mean by quantum computing strategy? And I, I don't want to predict, but there is a great likelihood that quantum computing will be a game changer, just like artificial intelligence is a game changer and other technologies have been. And a lot of things that we're using today will not work if we're using quantum computing. For example, our whole encryption is based on the idea that it is very simple to multiply prime numbers, but it is very difficult to put a large number into different prime numbers. It's, it's, it's almost impossible. It is taking too much of our resources. Quantum computing can solve these problems in seconds. So our entire idea of how we're using encryption technology will change. We need to think about quantum encryption, which is difficult. So in general, the technical developments, I'm trying to encourage them to say, look at this. But there are certain trends right now happening when we're analyzing cyber attacks that are in the focus of a lot of governments as well as boards of large enterprises. So first one is micro manipulations. When you're looking into ways how people are influenced and how people were influenced in the last years, you see there, there is a huge debate about fake news and, and all kinds of things and possibilities to influence people. But what we're seeing at the same time now is that the offenders are using way more sophisticated tools to influence people in a way that you don't really recognize what is happening. We're calling it micromanipulation, or you can also say approaches to hack your brain to influence you in a way that you would undertake an action that you would under usual circumstances not do. And with the technology we have, with sensors, for example, that can detect if your voice changes, if your stress level changes, um, and technology that can detect motions in your face that the, the human eye cannot detect, we can start manipulating people in a way that you would not even feel manipulated. So that's one of the, one of the trends I would like to highlight. And there is a second trend which is equally important, um, and maybe equally uh, scary. A lot of the decision makers that I'm dealing with that have to take responsibility when there is a national crisis or when a large enterprise is under attack, that means the CEO of a company or the minister who is responsible for national security, when they're confronted with a cyber attack, they would always look for the escape path. They would ask for different options and say, give me three options, which is the best for me, and I'm going to walk this way. But the offenders have in recent cases that we're discovering right now and that we're analyzing, they have undertaken an approach which is quite unique. They're putting the victim in a so-called catch-22 situation. We use the, the term catch-22 when you're in a situation where you can only lose, whatever you do. You can walk left, you lose. You can walk right, you lose. There is no way out of the situation. You can only differentiate between a complete disaster and maybe something, a bad situation, but maybe only close to a disaster. And a lot of risk management approaches in cybersecurity, approaches where we're looking into what is the right solution for this problem? What are we going to do if our website is taken down? What are we going to do if there is an extortion going on because the offenders are claiming they have access to our internal data? How do we respond? A lot of those strategies are focusing on the question, what is the perfect route out of this? What is the ideal situation? How can we get out of this without damage? 
And a lot of attacks that are taking place, or a lot of those very sophisticated attacks that we're seeing in the last 12 months, are based on a different approach. You will not be able to get there out easily. You will fail in any case. It's just the question, how bad will you fail? And um, this leads to completely new discussions that we haven't had in the past. In the past, we saw cybersecurity as something where we need a technical solution. And if you have a firewall and an antivirus solution, well, then you're, you're good. You're good to go. Uh, that was prevention. But now companies are realizing you will not be able to prevent everything. There is no chance that you are 100% protected, and therefore you need to prepare for the moment where you fail. And this uh, started to lead to discussions which are really fascinating, like, for example, discussions about cyber insurances. The cyber insurance sector is, is increasing dramatically. Uh, they're growing like crazy because companies now say, okay, if I am under attack, well, I would like to have an insurance. Um, so with this overview about the changing landscape, I would like to hand back um, to hear some more interesting presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco. Thank you. So, prepare to fail, get insurance, you're being micro-manipulated, um, and there are opportunities, if, um, if I may do a very, very brief summary, but thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Marco. Uh, next, we're going we're to take a dive in, into a uh, local, uh, local scenario. Uh, we'll ask uh, Vasilyu, uh, if you would, please. Коллеги, здравствуйте. У нас должна быть презентация. So we should have our presentation. А еще у нас где-то должен быть кликер. Also we have a clicker here. May I? Спасибо. Да, да, да. Я сегодня проснулся утром. So I woke up today at 6 a.m. И начал готовиться к And I started to prepare this presentation. And I realized, well, what do we gather here for? What should we speak about, about the digitalization of our digital economy? Uh, let us speak about previous two days of our conference, and let us discuss a bit what is what a digital, digital economy is. Let us go back several generations back. First revolution that took place, it was technological revolution. With the steam motor, we since the centralization of production. Second technological revolution that took place, electrification of the production process. Let's have a look at what happens now. We have the possibility to gather all the data, to digitalize it, to take centralized or decentralized solutions and to have balance, to strike balance. The speed of solutions is going higher and faster, and we now see the third economy, the third revolution, digital industrial revolution. Okay, let us now go back to go back on Earth and think about our everyday life. It's 10 a.m. Moscow Stock Exchange is open, and we are able to buy shares of any company at this Moscow Stock Exchange. Well, we are entering subway, managing train, train driving. It is even more curious. It is automated, and we see digital components there. But still, all this digitalization, what is it? What stands behind it? But if we look at any company, there are two big roles behind this process. First one is the transformation director who says, well, I see that there is a mega technology that will change the world, that will be a game changer. We'll have more money from our clients and we'll be able to do it better and faster. This technology will let us lower down our expenditures. This is the blockchain technology. And then they are using many fashion words that will give us give us good profits. And he goes to the director for security and he asks, can we do this? And he says, well, no, no, no. Why not? Let's speak about this. Is it myth or reality? Cyber threat. Well, I don't think that we will be having a dialogue with our spectators, but still, nevertheless, if you look at your day from today's morning, maybe it was you will, be, you will be able to find it on the Moscow cameras that, that, that are situated on the streets. I was rather persistent counting the cameras that I've seen, CCTV cameras on the streets. There are hundreds of them, and they are tracking my way here. And, this, and even and if a cyber attack will lead to serious, uh, serious circumstances, so, so we can see what are the numbers, what we see when we are protecting our clients all over Russia. Every 12 hours, 
every our client has as a minimum 12 incidents with security 12 incidents that are related to cyber security 12 not just events that something happened but 12 incidents with a real threat standing behind 13 instruments are appearing each month each and every month well thank you in commerce to hackers who are publishing new and new instruments which were used in the agency for national security operations and now they are accessible for everybody two or three new vulnerabilities are appearing each and every time why does it happen well this race that we see in the digitalization it is based unfortunately on three main problems it takes into account it is based on three major problems first one is IT unfortunately there is no order in the information techno informational technologies and we see it like this informational structure IT structure is kind of a forest and you won't be able to go through this forest and you'll be able to do something and this is the view that our security specialists have and hackers as well second problem we don't have personnel it is the reality the program program of digital economy that was launched with all the universities with all their efforts to prepare personnel and professionals to train professionals but in reality we see that we don't have enough professionals who will be able to do this who will be able to ensure our security in Moscow and if we look at the Russian regions who is training high quality security specialists we'll be talking about this later but where would you find those personnel those professionals who would ensure our digital security and digital services third factor is the security culture culture of security is is a simple example to have your password and name and put it on your screen but everybody is doing this this is silly entering entering bank client at the same computer when you played your video games is just not so good for your security and maybe you downloaded something from the official side not from torrent tracker it will be better once again we are creating the environment which is developing but this we are unable to ensure security and this happens not only at our level but also at the level of companies and now I can give you some examples about the consequences in April of this year everybody knows it especially experts net equipment that is used for communications all over the world had some vulnerabilities so what we fixed now what we've seen in the work of our clients from the first minutes the attacks were 20 30 times more intensive there were attacks on objects of critical infrastructure 20 30 times more intensive than something else FIFA World Cup in Russia when we were protecting some segments of the World Cup what we've seen number of attacks on the infrastructure was growing and this gr this growth was not one-time growth it was permanent the number of complex attack on objects which were planned before this not some student downloading some utilite and launching it no complex attack are some specific attacks by hacker groups they have one and a half attacks a day three attacks in 24 hours I don't have these statistics now but I had this information about the time but 60% of this attack took place in the day 40% at night all the companies that we have are being attacked 24 7 and how our security works in the companies five and eight so this specialist comes to work to t at 10 a.m. and he goes home at 6 p.m. what happens at night who follows it who watches it it's a problem 100% attack might be successful well we have technologies we have some protection services information protection services we protect our infrastructure hooray we can work now what's the problem what do we like how do you think friends and colleagues how can we protect this if you don't see this if you don't see what happens how can you protect it security needs hands and eyes when everything changes your most important asset and the detail that you miss are people people in the broad sense of this word people your employees yourself people that will ensure your security as security experts 
So this picture missed people. That's the most pre pre precious value of your business and it's the main mean of protection. What can we do with this? First, cybersecurity hygiene. Let's have a look at what happened 100 years ago. Epidemics all over the world. What happened to us? Vaccination and washing your hands before taking your meal. If you do this, it will be all right. So you cannot access your bank client with the phone that you are down downloading torrent with. Don't enter bank client from the computer that you are playing video games on. And please explain this to your children. If you wash your hands before taking your meal, you have to somehow ensure a hygiene and cybersecurity. All the technologies that are being created, smart cities, sec secure and safe cities, smart distribution nets, smart production, plants automatization, security, as our previous speaker has said, security is not an additional specifics that should be done afterwards. Security should be from the very beginning by design. Third, we, being the specialists in security, cannot limit the development of technology. We should assist and monitor and overlook and to control how this will be developing in the future. So the world has changed. Are we prepared for this? As a specialist in security, we can talk about this later. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, briefly, IT, HR, and culture. Okay? Okay. That, that's great. And security needs hands and eyes. Yeah? Okay. People. People seem to be the problem here. Okay. Uh, anyhow, uh, let's, keep go let's keep going with, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Maria. Yeah, would you please address the group? Нашего сегодняшнего мероприятия меня брали коротенькое интервью и задали такой достаточно любопытный вопрос. Ну, с одной стороны, банальный, с другой любопытный, который заставил меня задуматься. Какова же роль информационной безопасности вот в современной действительности, в современном обществе? Я с таким пафосом ответила, что да, информационная безопасность занимает такую роль, которую нельзя сейчас преувеличить. Но, а потом задумалась. Но действительно, информационная безопасность везде. У нас цифровая экономика. Мы давно не считаем на счетах. У нас у каждого в кармане электронный гаджет, почти компьютер, там, со всеми программами, откуда мы ходим в интернет-банке, совершаем платежи и переводы, как, да, опять же, говорил тоже предыдущий спикер Василий. Вот. И действительно, у нас все цифровое, а где цифровизация и информатизация, ну, там возникают риски, риски как раз связанные с безопасностью. И сегодня хотелось бы остановиться на одном из видов таких рисков. Риски, связанные с внутренними угрозами, с внутренней безопасностью, да, связанные с утечками данных. Вопрос, как важен, важен как в корпоративной среде, так и в личной среде, потому что у нас у каждого есть, не знаю, паспортные данные, есть какая-то другая чувствительная информация при privacy о каждом из нас. Ну и это все может быть так или иначе использовано против нас, но желательно этого не допускать. А наша компания как раз, ее такой основной вид деятельности – это защита от внутренних угроз. У нас существует аналитический центр, аналитический центр компании InfoWatch, и мы проводим ежегодный сбор статистики. Статистики по утечкам данных, какие данные утекают, откуда, соответственно, и делаем свои выводы. Эти выводы вместе с историями я сегодня хочу вам представить. Так получается, что в связи с ростом 
цифровой экономики с ростом информатизации растут и утечки данных. Да? Чем больше компьютеров, тем больше хакеров, тем больше данных у нас, да? потому что прирост данных чуть-чуть ли не в несколько раз ежегодный у нас массивы данных растут. Растут и утечки. Причем на слайде сзади проведена статистика как общемировая, которая активно растет вверх, так и российская, которая красит крас внизу, соответственно, которая выросла, но выросла не намного. Казалось бы, в России не крадут данные. Нет, данные везде крадут, просто в России об этом не любят разговаривать. И ну, никакая компания, как правило, да, не признается, если это как-то публично не было где-то объявлено о том, что у них украли данные их клиентов, украли данные, связанные там, с какими-то разработками, ноу-хау или, не дай бог, даже какую-нибудь государственную тайну. Общий тренд утечки растут. Причем, если посмотреть опять же на сравнение мировое и российское, виновником утечек данных в российских компаниях чаще всего являются все-таки внутренние сотрудники. Да, это мы с вами, которые ну, чаще всего считают, что если мы что-то наработали, мы можем это взять с собой и как-то потом использовать это так или иначе в личных целях. А по миру наоборот. По миру рост утечек от именно внешних каких-то атак, внешних нарушителей, он значительно выше. Тоже достаточно любопытно. Но с чем связано это? Возможно, возможно опять же, до данной статистики компании чаще всего проще обвинить кого-то внешнего в, в том или ином инциденте, чем признаться, что проблема внутри, внутри организации и проблема связана с людьми. Возможно так. Возможно менталитет. При этом хочется отметить, что если раньше крали из компаний незначительные массивы данных, то опять же тренд у нас на big data и на огромные сбор да, большого количества данных, то сейчас происходят действительно мега утечки, когда забирают все. На, на слайде приведены два, два примера как бы, утечек, связанных с большим количеством записей. Здесь более чем несколько миллионов записей за один раз похищались из компаний. И это, это сейчас тренд, потому что ну, забирают все и сразу. А плюсом является то, что подобные вещи проще отследить и проще предотвратить именно техническими средствами. А, потому что ну, когда идет подобный, подобный не знаю, вывод данных внутри компании, это легче обнаружить, потому что в любом случае это та или иная аномалия. А, кто же забирает данные из компании? Опять же, на слайде у нас мировая статистика и статистика российская. И мы видим, да, что чаще всего это обычные сотрудники, это мы, мы с вами, которые, ну, которые решают либо без всякого злого умысла поработать дома с какими-то базами данных, либо со злым умыслом что-то другое сделать. Интересный кейс. Мы вообще в компании да, собираем различные кейсы, от наших заказчиков. И недавний кейс, когда бухгалтер одной из государственных организаций решила дома поработать и свести то ли полугодовой, то ли годовой финансовый отчет. Каким образом она решила забрать файл, забрать файл себе домой? Съемные носители у нее безопасность же были на компьютере отключены, то есть возможность скопировать данные на флешку и тихонечко унести домой ну, отсутствовала. По, по техническим причинам безопасность позаботилась. А, при этом работала сеть интернет и были доступны ну, всякие публичные ресурсы, социальные сети, там, диски различные, там, облачные и так далее. Что она сделала? А, совершенно из самых лучших, самых благородных побуждений, да, работать в нерабочее время, а это, это тетечка, да, этот бухгалтер, она прикрепила финансовый отчет в паблик себе на страничку ВКонтакте в качестве вложения, чтобы дома спокойно зайти и скачать. Ну, об этом стало 
известна компания государственная и очень-очень серьезно. Ну, поэтому головы полетели у многих, не только у этой тети. Но это еще раз доказывает на самом деле, что ну, иногда вот подобные утечки, подобные выходы данных куда-то да, вовне, вовне не являются злым умыслом, а являются просто ну, какой-то глупостью со стороны да, тех или иных людей. Аналогично вот мы, да, мы как граждане. Да, вот. Мы же пересылаем свои паспортные данные, не знаю, там в банк копию паспортного данного, по паспортных данных копию паспорта для получения кредита, там, возможно, для оформления каких-то документов и так далее. И все это у нас выкладывается в облако, чтобы было удобнее достать, не знаю, остается в почте, потому что ну, никак никто, как правило, да, не заботится о том, чтобы потом эти данные были, были удалены. Из, из, из этих ресурсов, соответственно. И ну, чаще всего не задумываются, что потом же кто-то может эту э, нашу копию паспорта скопировать себе и использовать ну, в разных целях. Э, начиная от э, такого известного случая мошенничества в банковской сфере, когда э, копируется, э, ну, копируется, подделывается ваш паспорт, да, либо просто с копией паспорта злоумышленник приходит в офис оператора связи и оформляет вашу сим-карту на себя. Ну, то есть просит вашу же сим-карту от вашего имени перевыпустить. А сейчас же у нас, если вы, ну, я думаю, вы все знаете, что большинство банковских операций привязаны именно к одноразовым паролям на мобильный телефон, который приходит. Поэтому спокойно после этого у вас перестает работать телефон, вы замечаете, как правило, это не сразу, а вечером, а в это время меняется пароль от вашего электронного банкинга, и если есть что выводить, то выводятся денежные средства. Опять же, банальный пример, казалось бы, кража паспорта. И действительно, да, статистика показывает, что до сих пор как в мире, так и в России крадут персональные данные. Это до сих пор ну, такой наиболее лакомый кусочек для всех, Right. So sometimes uh, it can be just uh, pure marketing, for example, uh, for a targeting ad, so, or it can be used as some sort of specific services, or if you're a perpetrator, you know, I, can, I gave you an example uh, previously. Also, I would like to just briefly touch upon uh, the issue of statistics uh, on the nature of these uh, threats. That also confirmed my suspicions that, uh, you know, more often than not, uh, these uh, hacks are done just, ra you know, not specifically, in a, not uh, in, you know, by uh, some specific decision. Uh, they can be done uh, by just the chain of wrong decisions. For example, you just uh, stupidly uploaded uh, some data on your social network, or you just uh, want to work at home, taking some sensitive data from your workplace, uh, you know, trying to be the best employee as you can, but <laughs> we all know what can that lead, right? And also with that, one, one other piece of statistics, here we see channel leaks of uh, 2017, and they have changed. For example, if previously, by a larger margin, uh, these uh, the leaked data was, uh, you know, hacked into via email, more often than not now, I think uh, it, it can be accessed uh, via various internet channels, for example, cloud services, public cloud, I mean, or social networks, or just uh, some, you know, some general internet sources. This is a this is a, a trend that we can uh, still observe. So, why is it uh, happening? Well, probably I think employees and staff members uh, we we aren't stupid. We understand that uh, manage management services uh, they they exist in our company and they try to control uh, the leaks of information via email most of all. So that's why people ref resort to other channels. So how exactly can you protect yourself? On the corporate level, of course, uh, this is a responsibility of uh, your, you know, cybersec department or IT department that provide uh, you with all security needs. But on the individual level, you just have to think for once. Where and to whom are you sending this data? Where 
are you going to upload them and try to minimize your stupidity you know just delete them just do it don't store it uh, there just just for kicks because uh, you know if this information is uploaded uh, via cloud you just you just have to you know encrypt it with a password at least or you know zip it into an archive and also to uh, make it password protected thank you colleagues for your attention that is all so all the reports uh, if uh, you are interested in the subject uh, here's uh, my contact information Thank you very much, Maria. Веб-сайт InfoWatch это фантастический источник информации. Вы действительно вам стоит зайти на него и посмотреть на отдел утечек. Thank you, thank you, Ayava. Good morning, everybody. I hope you had a chance to have a coffee. Maybe you can have a coffee over here. Maybe you went to a Starbucks. Sometimes we all go to a Starbucks, and what's the first thing that we do when we go into a Starbucks? I know that even here in Moscow you have Starbucks. The first thing that you do, of course, after you order your coffee and you make up a fake name because they can never get your name right on the coffee, the next thing that you do, you log on to the free Wi-Fi. And this is what happens in Starbucks all over the world. However, recently, customers of Starbucks in Argentina discovered, thanks to a friendly hacker, that they were actually getting more than their coffee's worth. In fact, as they logged on to the free Wi-Fi in the stores, their computers were being used to mine for cryptocurrencies. That means a criminal has managed to get on to the Wi-Fi in the Starbucks branches all across Argentina, and they used the Wi-Fi login page to use a small JavaScript, very small script that the regular user would never notice is running on their computer. But this one friendly hacker who went into the Starbucks discovered that it was running, and he understood that this small JavaScript was actually something called CoinHive. I don't know if you've ever heard about CoinHive, but it's a very, a rather recent innovation from about a year ago, a little bit more. It's actually a product, it's a tool and a company that pr produces this tool, and they are actually building it as a new business model for websites to monetize their business using their users, that means you and me, computing power. Now, you might think this is criminal or crazy, but it's starting to actually pop up in more places, not just in the Starbucks in Argentina. This is a website in America, a very popular magazine. It's called Salon.com. It's a very progressive, liberal publication. And they recently started offering two possibilities, two modes of participating on the site. The first one is the free mode, which I'm sure you're familiar with many other publications. They use ads in order to give you free content, and they request that you remove the ad blocker. Alternatively, they are now offering you an innovative new model. Suppress the ads by allowing the site to use your computing power to mine for cryptocurrencies. So this is basically a new business model, an innovative business model that was perhaps started by criminals but is now being adopted by the traditional online advertising industry. Of course, I don't expect many of you have visited Salon.com. Let's try a, a site that you might be more familiar with, the Pirate Bay. Oh, you've never heard of it, of course. You are all saints. You've never pirated a video or a movie in your life. What am I thinking? Well, people in other countries who have visited the Pirate Bay in the past year have discovered that the Pirate Bay has actually used cryptocurrency mining on people's computers to generate quite a lot of revenue. It is estimated that about 30% of the people who visited the Pirate Bay had such cryptocurrency mining taking place on their computer. And when this is done in consent, that means that when the site asks you to do something like this, it's actually not illegal. But when it is done without your consent, we have a much more serious issue. So this is just, just one short story to get us started. What I wanted us to discuss today, what I want to share with you is my point of view about the future of cybersecurity. And that's not just the issues that we're dealing with in the past year or the past couple of years, but how cybersecurity is a changing problem. It's a changing landscape. And I want to share with you my view about this world from a friendly hacker's perspective. So I call myself a friendly hacker. I'm known as Karen Elazari, but online in the hacker's world, I'm known as Karen E. All of the E's are spelled with three, 
K3, R3, N3. That's my hacker nickname, and you can find me online. So if you want to send me some malware or effects or pictures of funny cats, you can find me online and do that. However, I actually started my path in the hacker's world more than 20 years ago. And in reality, I was a hacker, but I didn't realize it. Because I was a young girl, a very curious little girl in Tel Aviv, and I spent a lot of my time either in the school library or at home, and I was always curious. I always had a lot of questions. I always asked my, question, my parents questions. What would happen if we did this? Or I tried things like taking out cables and putting them in different places, or pushing buttons, reading encyclopedias before I went to bed. And if I'm honest with you, because in the sake of trust and transparency, I want to create a good relationship between us, that's not what I looked like. Here is a more accurate photo. So this is an actual photo from the yearbook of my school on the steps of the Mediterranean in sunny Tel Aviv, beautiful weather like this. And yes, I did show up to school that day, although it might be a little bit difficult for you to identify me in this picture. That's because I was so much of a nerd that I looked like a little boy. Yes, that's me. And even the kids who are playing Dungeons and Dragons wouldn't let me join their team because I was too weird for them. I spent most of my time in the library and at the school computer lab. And as you can see, even in the photo, I showed up with my state-of-the-art 1993 Sony Walkman gadget, which in my imagination made me into a cyborg. But I had a lot of friends online, better friends than those Dungeons and Dragons geeks who wouldn't let me join. My friends were hackers. And I met them in online chat rooms, on the IRC, the Internet Relay Chat, and those people, those friends of mine, they had no idea they were talking to a 13-year-old girl from Tel Aviv. I had a mentor who showed me the way, and I hope you might recognize this mentor in the next picture. Today, she's a very known philanthropist and a guest uh, faculty member at the London School of Economics, but back in 1995, her name was Angelina Jolie. She portrayed the fierce hacker Acid Burn in a Hollywood movie about hackers. And when I saw this film, I realized this is what I want to become. I want to be that sort of a hacker. I can be a, a girl and a hacker, and I could be the hero of the story. If you haven't seen this film from a long time ago, I'll give you a spoiler. The hackers are not the bad people in it. They're the ones who are actually uncovering corporate corruption, stopping an ecological catastrophe, telling the FBI who the real cyber criminal is, who is actually an employee of a corporate stealing money from that company. So the hackers could actually be the good guys and the girls. And that's what I wanted to become. Since then, it's been more than 20 years, I dedicated my career, my academic research, and my professional work to focus on what the friendly hackers and the real-world hacker heroes can teach us. And I haven't just followed in the footsteps of Hollywood hackers, but very real-world hacker heroes. Hacker heroes like Barnaby Jack. Barnaby Jack was a hacker from New Zealand, and he first became infamous for hacking ATM machines and literally making those ATMs throw money at him. This is a technique that was called jackpotting in his honor. Now, even today, you see this technique happening, although Barnaby demonstrated it to the ATM companies and the banking companies more than seven years ago. This is a technique that criminals still use all the time, even in Russia. However, after Barnaby finished his research on ATMs and finished explaining it to everybody, openly discussing his technology, he moved on to something else. He started looking at hacking medical devices. In fact, he discovered that he could hack remotely into an insulin pump. An insulin pump like this device right here, or this device, is actually something that saves the lives of a diabetic patient because it regulates the amount of insulin that is injected into the bloodstream. However, Barnaby discovered that he could use a radio antenna to remotely send a signal, a command to such a pump that would ultimately release all of the remaining insulin in one single shot into a patient. Of course, this is dangerous, potentially lethal, catastrophic, but he had never hurt a fly. In fact, he conducted this demonstration in a laboratory setting to showcase to the medical device companies just how dangerous this was. Today, in 2018, every new medical device company in the United States is now required to conduct cybersecurity testing, a requirement that they had, did not even consider part of their responsibility in the past. 
And all this is thanks to the work of Barnaby Jack and other friendly hackers who look not just on computers and internet sites, but also on medical devices. It was Barnaby who said, in response to his critics, the people who said that he's doing something dangerous and scary, he said that sometimes it takes the hackers to demonstrate the threat so that we may spark a solution. And I absolutely agreed with this idea. In fact, Barnaby Jack was my personal inspiration to consider that we can actually see the role of hackers in the world as elements of our immune system, helping us get safer, just like the friendly bacteria out there, showcasing the problems, making everybody actually safer. And I'm not talking about one or two hackers like Barnaby. I want to show you a few more examples. But that's not the only thing. At this point, you still might be skeptical. OK, maybe we need an immune system. Why do we need the help of hackers? Karen, you're asking us to trust who we think are the bad guys. Well, I'll give you a few good reasons. If we wanted to look at the internet, it would look like a living organism or an ecosystem. This is, in fact, a visualization of the World Wide Web, but from about 10 years ago. If I wanted to show you a snapshot of our world today, the digital world, it would be more like the Milky Way galaxy because it is an ever-expanding universe of new digital technologies, one that is simply larger, in my opinion, and too large for one company, one government, or one country to single-handedly secure or protect. It is an ecosystem problem. In fact, we already live in the planet of the machines. According to the Munich Security Council, in a report they released just a few months ago, 2018, this year, is the year that planet Earth officially is the home of more devices than human beings. About 11.2 billion devices, to be accurate, which is a little bit more than the 7.5 billion human beings. And that trend is only continue, going to continue to rise exponentially. That means we're going to have more technologies and more devices than ever before. In fact, if you put a hand to your heart and think about yourselves at home, I'm willing to bet a Bitcoin that you have more than human beings or pets or family members, you have a laptop, an iPad, an Xbox, a Sony PlayStation, and other devices in your house yourselves. So many of these devices are also going to become the digital army for criminals and bad guys to use. Just a few years ago, we saw a massive attack, a denial of service attack, that took down a variety of websites, an attack which was actually supercharged by people's personal devices. Hundreds and thousands of webcams, routers, digital video recorders, which all had one thing in common, a default username and password combination. And there is a lot more where it came from. So these were just the soldiers in one significant attack, which was called Mirai, an internet storm which took down websites like PayPal and iTunes and Amazon. But this was only the beginning. If you don't believe me that there are so many devices like this out there, take a look on Shodan, which is a search engine for connected devices. You can Google it or Shodan it, shodan.io. And on this platform, on this search engine, you can identify coffee machines, web servers, computers and gadgets that have been connected to the internet in an unsecure way. And you would be amazed by what you might discover. For example, I don't think anybody could guess what this is. This is, I'll give you a few hints, this is the control mechanism for a very unique vehicle, a very unique mode of transportation. It has directions of travel, backwards and forwards. Through this control mechanism, you can change the speeds or you can make it stop altogether. This is the control mechanism for this beautiful funicular vehicle, a uh, cable car, in the uh, Austrian city of Innsbruck, going up the Tyrolean Alps. Two friendly security researchers from Germany discovered that through the internet, they could actually access the control mechanism of this car. This was through the so-called secure remote maintenance system, which was installed. However, it turns out that it's not enough to have a secure remote maintenance system by name and to put a very beautiful, nice little lock icon on all your presentations if you don't actually configure it safely and securely. Those researchers were able to very easily get into that system. However, they did not cause any chaos. They reported it to the CERT, the Computer Emergency Response Team of Austria, and to the city of Innsbruck. 
and they took care of the problem and replaced the system and now require that any new systems put in place in that municipality and other Austrian municipalities go through security testing, thanks to these two German hackers. Now, we're going to see more devices going to be connected and they're going to be connected in exciting new ways, sometimes to older technologies as well. If you don't think this relates to you today, you may be right, but in three years or five years, smart cities are going to be a reality for many people. And that means it brings new types of threats. So I want you to consider that cybersecurity is not just about protecting secrets or preventing data leakages. It's also about protecting that physical infrastructure that powers a modern life. If it's the trains that we get to work on or the power systems. More than that, if we consider even going back to traditional data centers, like this, uh, for example, data center. By the way, I love their state-of-the-art cooling solution. I had uh, just the same type of cooling solution in my computer back home when I was 12. However, this is an actual data center in uh, the Ukraine, in Kiev. And this is the data center that became the patient zero for a massive malware attack that you may have heard of. It was called NotPetya or in Russian, Nipetya. This massive malware attack began in a traditional data center, but it actually disrupted the facilities of shipping companies and transportation organizations, and even a semiconductor factory in Taiwan. It all started there because this was not a virus that was designed to steal credit card details or to get your password. It was a wiper. And we're going to see more attacks of this type, wiper attacks. These are viruses that disrupt the systems, that destroy the master boot record portion of a hard drive of a computer. That means it's very hard to go back to normal businesses, the normal operations of business. And I believe we're going to see more attacks like this. So the future of cybersecurity is not about theft of information or secrets, it's also about disruption of digital access. And I really think this is something we need to prepare for. Now, more than that, we're, of course, going to see more attacks that are about crypto mining. That means using cloud servers, your computers, my computer, to mine, not just for Bitcoin, which is extremely difficult to mine on a personal computer, but actually for coins like Monero, which is considered a more hard-to-track digital currency that criminals have been mining at large. And we're going to see, of course, more of the ransomware attacks that we've seen in the past year. I bet you've heard about ransomware attacks, but very quickly we will explain that these are viruses that encrypt the content of your computer and then require a payment, usually in Bitcoin or another digital currency, to release back access to your files. So again, the criminals have figured out the perfect crime. They don't have to steal any information from you. They just destroy or disrupt your access to your own files and then request a ransom to receive that access back. In this interesting case of WannaCry, which I hope you'll hear more about later from our friends at Kaspersky, you'll also learn something very interesting, which I discovered. WannaCry disrupted millions of computers around the world. It took down about 30% of the UK's National Healthcare Services computers. But it was actually stopped thanks to this curious-looking internet address. This is the internet address that if you see in your computer, you would probably not give it a second thought. However, it was one researcher, one friendly hacker, who analyzed the malware and realized the malware is accessing this address. So he researched it, decided that he's going to actually register this address. And by registering this domain, taking control over it, he hadn't realized it, but he actually stopped the infection from going further. This researcher's name was Malware Tech, and I understand that if you meet a cat like that online that calls himself Malware Tech, you might think he's not a good guy. However, he was actually called an accidental hero because of his work researching WannaCry. After that, the UK tabloids, because he was based in England, the UK tabloids decided to uncover his true identity. So they researched, they researched, and they finally they found him in a small village in the east of England, a 23-year-old kid with no formal education who became the accidental hero that stopped this global malware infection. And I believe we're going to need more accidental heroes like him. People not necessarily with a traditional background and traditional education, but that are curious enough to go down that rabbit hole when they see a weird-looking internet address. So cybersecurity is not, more, not about secrets or about data theft anymore. I believe it's about a way of life. In fact, let me tell you a secret. I know all of your passwords. In fact, I'm sure that I'm not the only person that knows many of your passwords. Because I believe passwords to be an antiquated 
think of the past. If you heard about quantum computing, for example, passwords are not going to present uh, any challenge to even the current types of computers that we have today. In fact, many passwords can be found on this site, haveibeenpwned.com. Let me bring it up a little bit for you. This is a database of the usernames and passwords that have been breached or leaked in the past few years. They've recently hit more than a billion data records. And that includes sites like Bitcoin forums and Russian sites and Adobe.com and many work-related sites, for example, Dropbox and LinkedIn, who both had a massive username and password data breach. That means to me, or to any other hacker, that if I want to get into your company, your home, or your organization, all I need to do is find one of these passwords that was already leaked in one of these databases. That's because, unfortunately, the most common form of recycling today is password recycling. That means that a lot of people find one password that works for them, that they can remember, and they use the same password, or with a very slight variation, across different sites. And I know some people in the room have done that because everybody does this. This is because passwords, I believe, are not a practical way to protect our future. So what is a practical way? Well, first of all, you may have heard about two-factor authentication. And as you heard from Maria recently, many attacks that have to do with two-factor authentication have bypassed that sort of protection. So maybe that's not the best way to move forward. What about biometrics? Personally, I'm a believer in biometrics, and I encourage you to adopt that as well. However, if there are any entrepreneurs in the room, I hope you can find a better solution, better than passwords, that is, for our future. Of course, I would do recommend that if you take a look at your operating systems, you do want to have a most up-to-date operating system. That's not so easy, though, all the time. You might think about some of these out-of-date operating systems, for example, which have been at the epicenter of many malware and cyber attacks. Now, when you see this, you think, oh, well, I don't have any of those old devices at home. No, that's right. I bet you have Windows 7. Well, guess what? Windows 7 goes at end of life, that means end of support, in less than a year and a half. So that means organizations running on that out-of-date operating systems are also going to have difficulties. But, of course, perhaps you've moved to the cloud and you figure that cybersecurity is somebody else's problem. I say think again. I don't think that there are fierce cyber warriors defending you in the cloud. In fact, it just means your own responsibility for securing whatever you put up there has become larger. So cybersecurity, it is actually your job. It's not a government agency's job or the security department in your company's job. It is in our hands. And every day, we make hundreds of security decisions, like logging on to a free Wi-Fi or reusing the same password. Finally, if I may, I want to share with you who I think can help us protect that future. Every day, as you heard before, there are more vulnerabilities and more bugs, more software flaws discovered than ever before. However, there is a way to help turn the tide to help balance the fight against software vulnerabilities. That way is called bug bounty programs. And these bug bounty programs are actually a way that companies work actively with hackers from all over the world. Companies like MasterCard, Uber, and a company that uh, I'm sure many of these companies you've heard of. This is just an example of some of the most popular bug bounty programs in the world. But I want to talk about one company in particular, a company that everybody has heard of, although not everybody has their product, Tesla. One of the most interesting companies in the world, one of the most innovative companies in the world. Five years ago or six years ago, they actually brought their flagship product, the Tesla Model S, into the world's largest convention of hackers to actively invite these hackers to test their product. As a reward for identifying vulnerabilities, as a reward in their bug bounty program, they don't just give them money or a new Tesla, they give them something which is worth even more, a special medal, the Tesla Challenge Coin, which only a select few have. Now, you can't use this coin to buy things in the store, but it has a great reputational value. And this actually brings to Tesla some of the world's best talent. They've figured out this is a way to hire amazing security researchers. In fact, according to recent reports, the world needs a million more security professionals, at least a million more than we have today. So being a friendly hacker might be a great job for the future. Now, where will we find these millions of new security researchers? One place you might start looking is actually the US Girl Scouts organization. Because two years ago, the US Girl Scouts started a program to teach the Girl Scouts about cybersecurity skills. And I think that's in incredible, because we're going to need all the people, men and women, robots, and everybody in between, to join this industry. In fact, when I go to a hacking convention, I see humans. I don't just see technology. I see talent. I see the creativity and curiosity that every organization might need. 
Just recently at DEF CON, the world's largest convention of hackers, I saw 30,000 people from every corner of the world, from every shape, size, and walk of life that you can imagine, from ages 7 to 77 and further. I didn't just see humans, though. I also saw this. This is a competition, the first of its kind, between hacking supercomputers designed to hack autonomously and autom automatically one another. And this, my friends, is the future. This is a machine called Mayhem. It is the first ever supercomputer to win a hacking competition. It is now seated in the U American Museum of History in Washington, DC, because it is a part of history. But will this be a part of our future? I believe that in order to protect our future, we're going to need more humans, not just machines. And in order to do that, the choice starts in your hands right now today. Thank you. Thank you, my friends. Спасибо большое. Wow, Karen, thanks very much. Uh, that, was, that was great and fantastic. Uh, I just want to also congratulate the translators who, who while you accelerated, yes. they absolutely fucking rocked it. So great job, translators, guys. Great job. OK, uh, so moving, moving right along, uh, let's hear from Yuri from Kaspersky uh, before uh, we get into um, uh, last uh, presentation with Edward and then panel discussion uh, that will start with Dimitri. Thanks, guys. День добрый, дамы и господа. У меня самих, на самом деле интересная тема. Вот, товарищи безопасники, не дадут соврать, какие извечные русские вопросы спрашивают, если произошел инцидент информационной безопасности. Как вы думаете? Ну, самое популярное. Правильно, что делать? Это первое. Второе, кто виноват? Все правильно. Вот, собственно, об этом и хочется поговорить, потому что, ну, на самом деле... Ответ-то есть что. Это кажется, что вот это все нолики, единички, и все они какие-то непонятные, но если немножко копнуть поглубже, то э, все вещи можно немножко посоединять. Понятно, мы не правоохранительные органы. Лучше всех на этот вопрос всегда отвечают правоохранительные органы. Но э, мы можем им помочь. The general picture and then some technologies that may assist us to define who is behind one or another attack. Why do I speak about targeted attacks? So that's the scheme, roughly. All the attacks may be distributed in some levels or layers. 90% is traditional cybercrime, what we have in the internet, what is going to smartphones, this is spam, and this is about joint programs, and all these malware that tries to steal your password or username. Then on the second level we have people who perpetrate attacks on companies, on organizations, because you're able to steal a bit more money from companies or organizations or to ask for a bigger ransom in order to give back this access to their personal, their own data. This is the criminal business. And here people are being prepared. They are doing intelligence, they are prepare themselves, they are searching for ways of how to penetrate the company. Several speakers before me have noted that in most of the cases the problem is the people. That's true. The most important for attackers is to find a weak place with which you can penetrate the company because when you when you already penetrated the company it will go much easier first step is more is the most important step and in majority of cases people help these attackers to penetrate the company how to find a person to whom to send an email to super secret organizations you have to enter russian um, social media odnoklasniki or other social media you will see their posts there if it is director or another important manager. And at the top level, we see 0.1% of cyber weapon. There are different types of it. Well, we all know that everybody is doing this. All the states are doing this. It is cheaper than ground operations or spatial agents or so and so forth because a special agent can be caught and then interrogated. And he will say, for whom he is working, but the virus will not tell you this. 
it will not give you any information and it will erase or delete any information later. So it is really beneficial from a mechanical point of view. So everybody does it. So why do we are working with this upper part, with cyber weapon? Well, all the systems are more or less equal. They have more or less the same operational system, or more, they have more or less the same principles. And the vulnerabilities or methods that are being used at the upper level, sooner or later they will go to the second level and then will penetrate to the third level. I will show you a couple of examples of how this is, happens. So we'll start from the most simple thing. Let's go back to this third third level. And let's have a look on how can we understand who is behind these or that, these or that attack. There are different parts of hacker operation. First part is the infrastructure. Hackers need servers. They need instruments that they may use during their attack. And it's clear that, of course, they are humans as well. And they are a bit lazy. So they are trying to reuse something, use it once again. And thanks to this, we can connect the dots and draw the lines and to see the operations of different companies from five or six years ago by the same people that are active now. Second element is a code. Code may be analyzed as well. There are many techniques, how to make it more difficult, but still. There are methods thanks to which we can understand the way of this. We can understand from the different elements of code to attach a different reputation to it, and we can understand whether this code is good or bad, and who is the author of this code. The code that we see as a program, I mean. And the third element are the errors and mistakes during the operation. I will show it uh, now because, well, it's natural because they are humans as well. Let's start from the Bangladesh Bank. Do you remember the story that from the Central Bangladesh Bank there was a tap attempt to withdraw one billion dollars? Well, but they... But this operation was blocked because they made a mistake. And 90 millions, they were able to withdraw this money through casino. And of course, they turned it into cash and it was impossible to bring this money back. So our colleagues helped Bangladesh Central Bank to, uh, to work with this problem. And they showed some files to us. And we've seen that there was a unique part of the code. Well, guys, do you have some programming background here? Please raise your hand. Yeah, we have the whole panel here, thank God. So what's the method that with which you can delete the file? Do you know? Yeah, to with zeros or have another file. Yeah, we can continue but with the number of programmers. We have the same number of different methods of how to do this. So they have their own unique technique. The thing is that this same function was used during the attacks on Sony servers. When Sony Pictures Network was down because they deleted their servers, they used the same unique functions in order to delete the data. That's fine, right? Interesting, because it is uh, quite impossible to guess this algorithm, because it is evident that people are using the same guide and they are doing the same programs from this guide. But, and here they are making money out of this, you see. So who remembers this uh, day, 12th of May of 2017? Do you remember this day? Yes, WannaCry, sure. WannaCry was everywhere, in supermarkets, in shops, in Deutsche Bahn, everywhere, in different ATMs. So it was quite a problem. Well, all the researchers tried to understand, they tried to stop the attack, and the other type of investigators tried to understand who is behind this attack. And the first to do this was our colleagues from Google. In the name of Twitter, they published a perfect tweet. Uh, two hash files and distribution. So if you're not a specialist, you won't be able to understand what is there. But we understood what they wrote. And we've seen two same pieces of code. And those two pieces of code 
it was quite unique, this function was seen in this case of Bangladesh Central Bank, and this same piece of function, it was a unique one, it was not in any other program, it was there in WannaCry. Well, you won't be able to guess this, right? You were not able to write the same code, it's well, not true. So maybe it was just the same persons who perpetrated these attack and the Bangladesh Central Bank attack. So the attribution of this attack at the basis of general code, how to deal with this, what can we do about this? Well, there are a number of companies that already implemented this thing, and we also have a system. What, what do we do? Uh, we are cutting all the files in small pieces, and then we say, these pieces are in good files, these pieces are in bad files, and so we can establish the reputation of each file. We have new file and we see what part are you consisting of. So who was writing you? Bad people or good people? Bad guys or good guys? So the premier of such an, the, the exa an example of such an attack was found in a financial institution. It was a suspicious activity in the processing. This file was legal and it was addressing servers, uh, unknown servers. So we checked the memory and it was a legal program. Uh, we downloaded from the website, it was looking the same way that financial institution had it, but it had some weird piece of code. So one, one of these pieces was uh, malicious that was inserted during the elaboration of a program. So at night I called our Korean colleague, I woke him up, it was 10 p.m., he quit his family dinner, I asked this company, and by 1 a.m. we already fixed it. And then it turned out that the hackers penetrated the company and they just substituted on the conveyor the files. They substituted the files in order to make them as backdoors. So we started to look who could have done this, and we found uh, similar codes with, the di with, this, with different functions, and it really looked like the, the people who attacked some uh, game companies in order to stall their codes. And these same people have attacked submarine produce production companies. Well, I don't know who has done this, whether it has done a company who attacks game companies or submarine production companies, but that was the fact. Another case of CCleaner, uh, millions of users, and thanks to this system we found two similar pieces, and we were able to say that Axiom people are behind this attack. What is an Axiom? In 2008, if you remember, Google withdrawn from China because they were hacked, and so these instruments are being used since 2008, so thanks to these instruments we can draw these lines and draw these, connect these dots. Well, of course, all these technical means, if you know them well, you can fake them. Everybody can do this, everybody who knows how to do this, that's the example. As I've already, uh, I've already mentioned the case of NSA and Bangladesh Central Bank, and we were able to say that the hackers from North Korea are behind this attack. Well, okay, what do North Koreans can do in such a situation? Their normal behavior, what kind of, what kind of behavior could they have? What? No, 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 it's way simpler. You can just blame it on Russians. They just they just took and uh, added uh, Russian words in their own code. You know, they, they, they blended them, they diluted them, but they didn't take into account that uh, it, uh, it really looks like a Russian language because they used Google Translate. And of course it was obvious to us that <laughs> we would never use such stupid words. But they tried to blame it on us. That's That's reasonable, I guess. Well, of course, such uh, systems uh, that are working on a piece, piece of code or or some system of a of a of a similar structure, of course, uh, it's, it's obvious. But they also made another mistake when uh, we cooperated with the police investigation. They also used the VPNs to enter the their uh, command websites. So VPN both from China and South Korea, and then boom, they entered to, to VPN uh, from North Korea. And we tried to locate it, but you couldn't actually uh, buy 
North Korean VPN. It just doesn't exist. So I also would like to make a call back uh, to the first speaker because we as a digital industry, the cybersecurity industry, we've learned more or less uh, to tackle these uh, threats. So we get we have uh, friendly hackers that uh, showcase the problems. So we have technologies uh, that uh, can help us uh, to protect our systems. Uh, there are some processes that of show us uh, you know how to be solve these issues. There is some sort of informational awareness. So we 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 kind of we kind of know what to do with the with the, you know cyber espionage and the stuff like that. You know informational leaks. But what to do with the manipulation of public opinion? As an industry, we don't know what to do, really, because this is this is a tricky one. This is a tricky th stuff because here you need some proof, right? But over there, for public opinion, you can just you know. It could just hype up. And then as, as an industry, we also have to think about this. We have to think about technology that would help us to also tackle the issue of uh, public opinion. Thank you for your attention. Yuri Namesnikov of Kaspersky Lab. Uh, thank you, Yuri. That was, that was uh, really fun. And uh, as somebody who works, in the, works with, uh, with a news agency, Russia Today, I can uh, absolutely sympathize and empathize with the, 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 uh, the final points that you made. Uh, okay, our last presentation before we go to panel, and then guys, like, you know, that's for you. It's questions. You've come, so ask your questions, get them ready. We want to hear your questions to these guys. Uh, this is why they're here. So, uh, <clears throat> very quickly to introduce you to Edward Fosk Villaronga. Um, he's uh, working on um, you know, robotics legislation, and I'm sure is going to broaden our minds in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you, Edward. No, thanks to you and thanks for the organizers. Um, my topic goes a little bit um, farther of all these discussions that are very um, concrete, but if you make the connection between both topics, I think that it's pretty scary. So my talk is about law and robots, and I'm here to talk about like how can Russia regulate robot technology. So when we think about robot technology, we normally think about robots that they have been deployed in the industrial environments, and that is the robots that have been regulated so far. Robots that work in very precise tasks and that they are normally um, caged and uh, the human operator is um, separated from that, basically because the regulator, what they wanted to do is to protect them. So basically, physical safety was kind of ensured. The problem is that right now there is all this robot technology that it is um, called service robots, so robots that perform useful tasks for humans. And um, these robots are meant to do different uh, tasks in interaction with users that they are not experts, users that they lack uh, technical skills, and um, robots that basically are are in interaction with people that normally lack the capabilities that uh, technical people do. So regulations need to address these new issues that they are arising in order that, to make sure that the uh, human-robot interaction is, is safe. So as we can imagine, like with this robot technology, like not only like physical uh, safety matters, but also other types of issues, and especially um, there is another type of safety that I want to raise here is the cognitive safety. So with risk technology, we do not always interact in a physical manner. So we always, we also interact with them in a social manner. So there, and they have been deployed in therapeutic context. So it may be also important to not only address physical safety, but also um, uh, cognitive safety. But then also, like, there has been, like, many issues concerning what is the responsibility, who is going to be responsible when something happens, when a hacker hacks the system and then something goes wrong. And this already happened. And actually, the main question with robotic technology that they are being used for um, uh, the general public is who is going to be responsible when these robots are autonomous? And then there are many other questions, but uh, one of them is obviously privacy. So linked to all the presentations that we've been having here, I, I was thinking like two important questions that arise in my domain of application. So um, 
there are many of these robots that they do not actually need any password. They just directly work, and they do not require any password or any security. And if I, if I ask Ivor, like, what do you see in the screen? What would you tell me? Do you know what is this? A Hoover, yes. So it is iRobot Hoover, right? Um, and normally, in general, people, what they identify is this as a vacuum cleaner, but actually it's a robotic data processing device that collects information through cameras and it is planning and navigating through your own house and basically the owners of the uh, of Roombas actually wanted to sell this data to Google because actually one of the problems of navigation systems right now is that they cover outdoor space but they do not really know a lot on how to navigate inside right so Awareness of uh, the collection data is very important because actually we will not be really aware of what type of data is being collected and whether uh, this is processed um, in our, um, yes, if it is uh, processed. And then also there are long-term consequences. So um, the latest research is actually pointing out that the addiction to screens is actually connected to um, the shrinking of the prefrontal context, and that is linked to um, alienation behavior. Um, so this technology, and especially screens in this domain, um, they have um, consequences that at the developing of this technology might not be foreseen. So this is something that we also need to take into account when we are trying to regulate um, robot technology. So robot developers actually like found themselves in this situation where they already have like a lot of problems in developing their robot technology. It might be already very complex like to make a robot standing up directly. They might not really know what are the regulations that apply to the robot. They might even confuse um, ISO standards, for instance, with public policy making. They might think that, well, I have the ethical review board um, approval of my university, so I do not have to deal with any more regulations when they do not know that the IRB is protecting the users that they are involved in the research project, but they, that might not really cover whether that um, robot is ethical or not. Um, and then also they might not really think that their technology have like future uh, consequences. And then, of course, what happens is most of the times is that robot developers might think that the law is actually impeding innovation and it is really posing a lot of barriers for, to foster that innovation. But on the contrary, the law can actually enable like the adoption of these technologies and actually like most of the times even the policymakers do not really know what laws they need to apply for this kind of technology. Nobody foresee at some point that we would have autonomous cars. Nobody thought that maybe we would have um, driverless um, um, manned, uh, I, sorry, uh, driverless um, aerial vehicles for instance and also there might be not even any applicable rule to specific and, uh, and concrete um, cases. And also, like, normally the laws tend to be technology neutral because they try to cover a wide range of different technologies, so that does not really help. So that there's this miscommunication problem between robot developers and policymakers. So when the policymakers actually say regulation, then the robot developers panic. And then in the other way around, actually, like when um, roboticists say that they are going to develop autonomous behavior, then the, the policymakers are the one that kind of freak out because actually they are not really sure like how are they going to deal with this autonomy. So basically what happens in here is that sometimes uh, it is not very clear when do we need to regulate technology. So whereas uh, the early stage of a technology developing a hard law might lead to overregulation because we do not really know what are the impacts or what are the risks of this technology, then at a much more uh, mature stage of the development of this technology, maybe apply, uh, applying non-binding uh, guidelines might lead to an under-regulation scenario. This is called Collingridge uh, dilemma. So what did the European Union uh, do? So European Union is trying to push uh, European Parliament is trying to push European Commission in regulating robot technology. And in February 2017, the Parliament released this resolution that kind of pr promotes or uh, the, the creation of this comprehensive framework for robot technology. 
there are many good points of this resolution that we can really learn from it. Like one of the points is that legislation should not always be technology neutral. So when you think about data protection laws, at least in Europe, they are calling for different uh, criminal charges or also like up to 4% of the total uh, turnover of a company if someone does not comply with the regulation. The problem with that basically is that if it is a technology neutral regulation, then it is not very clear from robot developers like how they can accommodate all that in their um, devices. But then what it is clear in that um, piece of uh, the leg of it is that um, robots demand special attention and that different robots pose different types of questions. So a robot that it is being deployed in a healthcare setting is not really the same as a robot developed in a farm, for instance. Then another point is that robot developers need a code of conduct. Then also they consider that actually there is uh, su such an important topic around this that it should be considered the creation of an European agency that addresses uh, the regulatory aspects of robot technology. But then also that there need to be like different ethical principles that need to be respected in this development of this um, technology. The problem with this technology, and that is what if someone needs to be thinking about new laws, so in the case of Russia and this summer talks, like on how can we really think about how to regulate technology, is that we need to learn from other actors at in the international level that they are trying to do regulatory initiatives in this respect and try to avoid some uh, of the tricky points of this. So in this case, the European Parliament was pushing towards the creation of a special legal status for robot technology. It kind of had the impression that they were trying to shift the responsibility towards the autonomous system. It is something called a responsibility cap. There's a lot of people that think that not because a robot is behaving in a way that has not been foreseen by the robot developer, the robot developer should be held responsible. But the system. So I do not really think that that is like our solution because actually there's a lot of people that it is behind the robot uh, development and actually there's a lot of um, physical and uh, legal persons that are behind this robot technology. Then also one of the aspects that they say when they talk about her robot technology is that basically this robot technology, it is going to enable medical staff and other caregivers to devote more time to diagnose and to better plan treatment options. Actually, the latest research is trying to say uh, with Babylon that there are AI systems that actually diagnose better than humans. So what we need, if we ever have a legislative document that actually provides such a framework for this technology, it needs to be grounded with the latest research and actually trying to um, point to the direction that is really going to, to, um, to cover the needs that, that this technology poses. And then another of the parts that he, they um, mention is the reversibility concept. This is very interesting and it connects to the rest of the panelists here. So they say that robot technology should have the ability to undo the last action or sequence of actions um, and uh, to enable users to undo undesired actions and to get back to the good stage of their technology. But the problem of robot technology is their dual cyber physical nature. So um, when we talk about robot technology, we can be thinking about robot technology as a standalone systems, and they might have like different problems connected with these uh, robots, but the problem is that in order the robots to be uh, lightweight and mass produced, etc., they need to be little, they need to be lightweight, and they need to be very easy to be produced. So basically, most of them, they are trying to move a lot of um, computing power up to the cloud so that actually the processing is not really happening in the robot, but to the cloud. And this is completely enlarges the problem if we just focus on the robot technology as the European Parliament seems to focus. So if you heard about the different presentations that we had today and you combine both, I think that this is pretty scary. So we will be have the more and more robot technology in our uh, homes, uh, robots that might not need any password, uh, Robots that with whom we will be interacting in a natural way because the more and more we try to create technology that it is invisible to us, that they just help us, but they kind of mingle with our reality. But at the same time, there will be this data processing process 
just at the background of this technology that not only will be connected to the cloud, it will be connected to other robot technology, and also, of course, other, to other things. Basically, a robot will be a thing inside of the Internet of Things. So actually, like if we can think about this and we can think about the, how quickly everything could be spread through cloud computing technologies, actually, we even think that, well, this problem might be even um, much um, better. So what are my recommendations uh, if, um, if a country should be thinking about regulating this kind of um, technology? Well, first of all, I would develop like different, different uh, or different or like ethical principles that reflect what are like the Russian traditions. Actually, when we think about robot technology, we think about also different robot developers that come from many places in the world. And even if we really aim at that, at, at operating at an international level. It is also very important to know like the differences, the cultural differences that exist between different nations. And it is not the same developing a robot in Japan or developing a robot in the US. So I think that this is also very important. I think that one of the things that needs to be done is to pioneer the development of sector specific frameworks. Right now, there's not very clear like uh, what kind of frameworks different type of robot have. And this is very important because actually when you were telling that in testing zones that now medical devices might have these uh, cybersecurity tests, I actually think the same way. Like when we have testing zones for different robot technology, these, um, these, um, uh, these uh, uh, testing zones should be multidisciplinary because robot technology actually poses various um, uh, different types of, of, um, of uh, problems. Um, one of the things, and I am finishing actually, uh, it is to take the lead in translating general principles into concrete technical rules. It is very easy to say, especially when we come from the school of law, that privacy needs to be respected, that privacy needs to be by design. But when you are a developer, you really need to understand like what is that? Like what are the technical um, tools that you are using that actually they are enforcing what it is stated by the law? Because otherwise, it might, you might be incurring a risk of applying something that actually does not um, ensure the goals of the regulation. Then also, others the whole ecosystem of robot technology, including all these cloud robotics uh, background, and then. In my opinion, I think that one of the things that needs to be done is to increment a lot of user-centered design approaches. There's a lot of money being spent in projects that they do not really match the user needs. And this is actually very bad because this is public money that it is being spent in something that it is not very useful. So I think that it should be as, as per the principle of efficiency to in increment this. And Last but not least, least but not last, no, last but not least, uh, point is actually like to foster education in multidisciplinary levels and also like in different um, levels of education. It is very important to have ethical courses in robotics labs. It is also important to have um, computing um, uh, education in a school of laws, etc., so that we are all both. Um, enriching each other with the different disciplines. Thank you so much. Thank you, Edward. Thank you very much. So, um, that was fascinating. <coughs> Particularly, uh, like, I don't know about you, but my personal what the fuck moment was the vacuum data that completely freaked me out. Um, so, uh, We've heard a lot this morning from, from a, a pretty amazing panel so far, and I, wanna, I want to turn to uh, Dimitri from, uh, from Bizone now. Uh, Bizone uh, being part of the Sperbank ecosystem, Sperbank being run by uh, German Greff, so we're talking about somebody who is very committed to digital innovation, to changing digital culture in Russia, a guy who believes that industrial-level blockchain can be deployed in Russia in 2019. Uh, um, and who, who sits, you know, uh, or, or who has the ear of uh, uh, the presidential administration. So Dimitri comes uh, comes to this from a very interesting point of view. So uh, perhaps if you, if you might address uh, uh, 
two points, if you might. One is kind of general response, and the other kind of the, the uh, uh, um aspect of that too. Uh, while we are sitting in Moscow, I will talk in Russian. Please excuse me. <laughs> Well, let's try to talk about digital economy today. Uh, well, I've read the annotation about today's discussion, unlike other speakers, I guess. Well, digital economy at international level is rather sad. If we look at what happens in cybercrime community, and if we look at the official statistics, for example, of World Economic Forum, we'll see that in 2017, world economy has lost, because of the activity of cybercrime communities, around $1 trillion. Those are two GDPs of Norway, and GDP of uh, Russian Federation in 2017 was $1.4, $1.45 trillion dollars and 2016 according to Klaus Schwab statistics accounted for 40 450 thousand billion dollars so growth was two times why and trends of shrinking of this exponential trend we don't see any trend in shrinking of this of the of these processes why because unfortunately at international level Law makers don't understand anything in technologies. Well, everybody is speaking, spe is speaking about GDPR. We are trying to protect citizens from European Union from his personal data leakage. But we understand that this will lead to construction of digital walls in the European Union. We understand, we researchers understand that GDPR has closed who is server. Now we are unable to draw any information from this, now it's impossible to understand who is behind different manipulations from with IT, IT, IP address. Now with this, we need official requests to police organizations. And according to our experience, when we do this, it will take from three to four months if we have good relationship with police authorities. So this is a huge gap between with what cyber uh, criminals are doing. We have political turbulence, countries are not talking to each other, they are not exchanging information between each other, and they are trying to put obstacles to each other. This geopolitical turbulence is assisting cyber criminals. If he's sitting in one country and steals in another country, he will be immune. You won't be able to do anything to him. Even if researchers from Kaspersky lab or we will be able to approach physical person will be will be unable to do anything to him well, we have a lot of TV shows like hackers TV show uh, Karen has mentioned this film and they are making this profession a bit romantic so as a result all of this in today's world says that there will be no digital economy and if we have today's trend today's situation maybe in 70 or 80 years, we will participate in Mad Max film rather than maybe a Star Trek movie. We have to do something about this. What can we do about this? First of all, we have to try somehow to launch platform solutions for automatic data exchange. Because today, this data exchange about threats is just when we send to one another some PDF documents and official police notes uh, and sometimes they are getting behind in one year or two years depending on the uh, bureaucracy of different countries because we are working a bit slower than for example Netherlands and Chinese authorities don't, don't give any information to anyone and in this political situation business major international business is in fact our unique chance, one and only chance to change something. That's why the basis of World Economic Forum, there are different initiatives. For example, last week we visited the headquarters and 85 CEOs of different major international companies that are covering 90% of world economy. As for the volume, we try to understand what can we do. We are unable to talk to our governments, they do not protect us, but at the same time they publish laws that makes our li make our lives even more complex. What can we do? And we came up with different initiatives and we had different agreements. 
So today, only international major business may lead our planet to innovations, unfortunately. I am happy that our government is aware of this, and in our project Digital Economy, we have many working groups where corporation, corporations are cooperating with each other, and they do hear us. I would have a discussion with you, but unfortunately we have our time until 1 p.m. and I have to leave you, unfortunately. Well, we are optimists. We in Sberbank Group and, and in BI Zone, we believe in our bright future and we are trying to spare no efforts in order to reach this bright future sometimes. Well, I have three kids. I hope that sometimes, in someday, they will be living in, different, in, in a digital world. So please, dear organizers, put the video, please. How do we see this future? Звука нет. Голоса не слышно. Well, we didn't hear the voice at this video, but there were some technical problems, I guess. Well, the, re the, the idea of this video is very, is very simple. The world would be better if everybody would unite their efforts. Oh, well, we have a huge online audience that are watching us, and we invite all the researchers. We do invite all the socially matured companies, all the experts, in order to cooperate. We are open. For the dialogue, you can enter our website, bi.zone. We have a major number of our own conferences, expert level conference for politicians, and we are ready to cooperate in order to make our world a bit better. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dimitri. <laughs> so, um, guys, it's it's time to open the the, uh, the microphone to some questions. Um, <clears throat> so, if any of you have questions, please uh, the guys are at the front. Just let you raise your hand and uh, put any any uh, questions you like to our panel. I want to continue on uh, the theme that Dimitri uh, raised right at the end, and I'm going to take a quote um, from you, Mr. Namisnikov, by the way. Uh, which is the following. Uh, from a cybersecurity researcher's perspective, I believe sharing information leads to winning, as rapid sharing of threat intelligence can help stop dangerous cyber threats from causing significant damage. If we, I'll take another quote from Wired Magazine's uh, recent article on Maersk and, uh, and uh, Notpetya, uh, which is a really human story, by the way, uh, but the, the, uh, <clears throat> the paragraph reads, it's the story of a nation state's weapon of war, uh, well, actually, two nation states, it was, uh, but either way, released in a medium where national borders have no meaning, 
and where collateral damage travels via a cruel and unexpected logic, where an attack aimed at Ukraine strikes Mersk, and an attack on Mersk strikes everywhere at once. So, collaboration uh, is fundamental. Ethics questions are absolutely uh, fundamental to where we are too. So collaboration is fundamental, um, and, the, uh, and the attacks are happening in a more unpredictable and kind of internationalized, globalized way, yeah? Where are we systematically, you know, how satisfied are each of you guys with where we are, and what would be like your, you know, what would be your golden step if each of you could, could, could say, okay, you know, I want to take one step today, and we get it. You know, uh, ladies first. So when it comes to international cooperation on cybersecurity, uh, I think it's great, I promote it. However, it's really important to remember that it really depends on where you stand. That means what's your ideology, what's your worldview. And it would be naive of us uh, to expect, for example, cooperation or sharing of information from the North Korean units dedicated to cyber attacks. Uh, in the same way that those, uh, as Yuri mentioned, the uh, attacks on financial infrastructure was affiliated with North Korean, with the North Korean government as a means to, to get money for that government. If a government is under sanctions, if it's under attack diplomatically, it would be naive to expect them to share their data or collaborate on that level. Therefore, I encourage international cooperation on cybersecurity, but I think we must remember also our differences. And I come from a different part of the world, and I'm here as a guest, but we all share different world views. And so it may not be very easy to achieve. Therefore, I promote other means of cybersecurity other than necessarily international cooperation. I don't think that's going to happen very soon. I'm pessimistic on that. Panel? Uh, uh, I, I, th I like the last point you just made. Um, I I believe there is a common sense that if there is an attack, uh, let's say against a financial institution, that we would like to investigate it and identify the perpetrators. But when it comes to the, to the details, when it comes to more sophisticated cases, when it comes to, for example, the question of free speech, uh, or the attack against a political organization, uh, or the attack against an election, um, you will see a reluctance. I'm for many years working with the United Nations, I've previously been working with the Council of Europe that has one of the major conventions and in international cooperation. And when, when you're looking into the details, especially when you're looking into the legal details, you will see that while in practice it works on a, on a, on a, on a, on a general level in the smaller cases, yeah, when, when, it, when, it, when we're looking into the smaller cases it works fine. When it comes to the more sophisticated cases and the ones where different values are triggered, then we see there is very little chance for, for cooperation. And I, I believe that one of the issues that is frequently raised by the Russian government in, in this regard is that the existing instruments that were developed more than 10 years ago were not truly international. They were uh, developed on a European level and spread, but this is we currently don't have an international framework. I mean, it's crazy enough. We're all using the similar protocols. You cannot connect to the internet if you refuse to use TCP IP. There is no chance. But we don't have globally applicable similar rules when it comes to the legal framework. So, so I believe we, we need to exactly work on, on the points of identify, identifying which are the minefields where we don't want to step into and develop a solid framework that allows us to cooperate outside this minefield. If I may, um, and actually, yeah. like, I don't know what happens with new technologies. Like, there are a lot of uh, fields, like um, chemicals or uh, food, that they are highly regulated, but when it comes to um, law and new technologies, sometimes it's not very clear that there are not that, that many clear rules on, like, what needs to be done. So I think that that is one point that I want to raise. And then the other one is that, um, there has been uh, some initiatives uh, from the standard uh, point of view, from um, IEEE and uh, the British uh, Standard uh, Organization, also ISO standards, uh, trying to accommodate different principles into their standard um, and in the uh, standard setting. The problem with this is, again, that um, these standards are non-binding, so we need actually like some mechanisms actually to make all these standards binding so that we know for sure that people are following the rules. 
And by that, I also mean uh, some mechanisms to establish uh, consequences for um, violations. Which but, but Eduardo, people, there will always be people who don't follow the rules. You know, I, I represent people who don't follow the rules professionally, right? This is a, a mindset that we will always have in the world. I really, truly don't feel like cybersecurity globally is an issue that can be solved with regulation, legislation, or cooperation. It won't also be solved just, you know, these challenges won't only be solved by technology means. They will be solved by, I believe, adopting a different mindset and a more uh, ecosystem view. So definitely it's not a single country's issue to work on by its own and to collaborate with other countries. Uh, but you will always need to take into consideration the outsiders, the, the edge cases, the countries that go rogue, the criminal organizations, and this will be a part of our future. I'm, I'm confident on that. How we encompass that and how we evolve our thinking about our expectations, I think it's a challenge for the future. Sure, if I just can answer this, um, it's true, but it's also true that um, when it comes to, for instance, uh, healthcare applications, we do need to be sure that the minimum are respected, right? Like when we have like um, devices that they are dealing with uh, elderly, with infirm people, with the children, it is important that there is like at least a basic framework. So it's not that I don't, do not uh, acknowledge. It's coming. it's coming. So actually you mentioned medical devices. I support a group of friendly hackers, which is called I Am The Cavalry. And they actually came up with something which is called the Hippocratic Oath for connected medical devices. So this is a voluntary oath, just like doctors have Hippocratic Oath. This is a voluntary commitment to cyber safety, which they had formulated and suggested to medical device companies. And more and more medical device companies are voluntarily taking upon themselves to commit to this oath of cyber safety. So similarly, grassroots efforts, community efforts could lead to ethics frameworks being adopted I do more believe in the voluntary adoption than the regulatory requirement in this particular case. Definitely. I, we definitely need more of that, of those um, oaths and so. Um, but yes, when it comes to the bindingness of, of laws, um, yes, uh, it would be ideal if everyone would voluntarily adopt to these systems and it, would, it will work very well for those that voluntarily adapt, but then there is always the the question open like what do we do with the people that do not so you came back to my first point <laughs> Yuri. I, I said a little bit of a, a trap for you up <laughs> down there Thanks. and that's why i do believe yeah. that we need more enforcement we'll bring it back to them <laughs> sorry uh, uh, if you uh, if let me like jump in <laughs> uh so to my, you mentioned like one small step that we can make uh, I see this uh, uh, like the whole issue of collaboration, uh, like uh, like making uh, life of cyber criminals harder, is that uh, there is an issue of trust between researchers, between uh, governments, and so on. And this is real showstopper because uh, when you don't trust, you can collaborate. It's not possible. Yeah, and as Dmitry mentioned, uh, there is there are a lot of geopolitical issues right now, and uh, we uh, the only way we can like try to uh, approach this problem at least, we uh, have to be a bit more transparent. Uh, our how we collect that data, for example, yeah, like you don't want to like uh, out of the blue understand that you your vacuum cleaner. Uh, like collects data and sells it to someone else. It's not normal. You want to uh, like to be consent and to understand that you like if you use it, like some data is collected and how it is collected, how it is processed, uh, who has access to this data. This is like uh, core points. And actually, I think we can make our industry more transparent. Uh, like we can give normal, ordinary people access to the uh, uh, way we process data, to, so they can understand uh, what happens, at least. Yeah, like GDPR is the first uh, such step, but we can do a bit more. Like, uh, even uh, companies can do more, because you don't need to wait uh, like, uh, that laws push you to do something. You can do it by yourself to be more transparent, uh, like, to, like some companies open uh, 
including our company, we are uh, approaching this way, uh, like we are opening uh, global transparency centers around the globe. Our first will be in Switzerland, uh, where we will uh, like place, uh, or, like uh, we will process data from European Union uh, users. Uh, so, and third party will be able to uh, uh, access and understand how we do it. So it will be more transparent, so everybody can uh, check, like government or I don't know, uh, like any third party can check what we do, and uh, like we can stop in such a way we can stop this problem of trust because we can like we can prove that everything is okay. We can prove that we behave like normal ethical hackers, normal ethical researchers, and we are here to protect you. Like cybersecurity is to protect, not to harm you. Mm -hmm. Раз, два, три. Спасибо. Uh, I am sorry, guys. My English isn't perfect. That's why our auditor is Russian. That's why I will speak in Russian, I think. Uh, друзья, я бы посмотрел. Я с вами согласен. I, I agree with you. It is uh, indeed very important uh, to maintain exchange uh, of information on a global level. <laughs> that uh, happen also on the international scale. But let's take another approach to this, uh, because it's all, uh, you know, a layered cake, because indeed the exchange of information based on some ethical uh, norms and standards is important. But let's take another step on the level of nations and authorities. In Russia, it's not so bad. Let's take a look at legislation that was adopted in Russia just uh, on December last year, and is now being uh, adjusted. We operate uh, special information exchange we make uh, we made a special department of uh, prevention of cyber attacks uh, critical infrastructure objects are, are being linked uh, with uh, each other and they exchange information on possible threats and solutions and within the framework of uh, one nation it is being launched let's take another l step on the next level international level this uh, global issue that we're discussing you gave a very good example on how was the other examples uh, of uh, protection system were established in different industries. More or less, I think, is going to be the next step in our evolution. The next step of evolution will be in these uh, multilateral relations uh, that uh, appear in our world. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's complex. Yes, it will take some time. But probably it's just the next step that we, as Russia, we haven't uh, come close yet. I admit, I tried uh, to take another approach on what's happening uh, in the outside world. Uh, from the legislative level. Actually, I haven't found out any radical uh, differences on uh, what ha has happened. To sum up, it seems that it's uh, just a gradual step that we have to take, and ra now Russia is uh, taking these concrete states, uh, both public sector, private sector, and the individual people. And what's important is, of course, we have to uh, keep up with the pace of technological development. Yes, uh, colleagues, just a small comment on digital economy since uh, we've been talking about it for the last uh, two days. In one of the initiatives uh, within the framework of uh, our digital security and digital economy, there is a there is a subsection that is related to international cooperation within the framework of uh, informational security. This initiative has uh, all the steps how it's going to be implemented. Because for me, it's a little bit scary to take a look on the, you know, relation towards Russian hackers to Russia in general. Because, you know, we are being the scapegoats uh, most of the times. So how exactly is this going to be implemented? Well, we just have to see. Well, let's try to adopt optimistic look, is what I have to say. We all remain, да, мы, we all remain optimistic. Мы все, конечно же, оптимистичны. Guys, questions? Микрофон где? Вот, спасибо. Добрый день, меня зовут Крылов Иван. Подскажите, пожалуйста, вот такой момент. Илон Маск в одном из своих интервью сказал, что он видит наибольшую угрозу человечества от развития искусственного интеллекта. Humanity is artificial intelligence, and uh, as a counterbalance to it, uh, he is looking into 
uh, neural nets and neural interfaces. So how far is uh, cybersecurity is focused on these uh, technologies? I'm, I'm talking about, uh, you know, long, far, long term future because we don't know how AI is going to work. But uh, still, I'm very concerned. So how exactly can uh, we see some progress on this topic? Если хотите, я бы хотел ответить на вопрос. Спасибо большое, что вы задали этот вопрос. Очень интересно, что Илон Маск лично на прошлый месяц приехал на нашу конференцию хакеров. Я с ним даже встретился, разговаривал, и он приехал туда для того, чтобы искать таланты. Он говорил о трех вещах. Искусственный интеллект и безопасность систем, и Тесла, и безопасность автономных машин, и таланты, которые ему как раз нужны были для этого. И третье — Space communication and how to create today the standards for let's call it the Internet of Space to the standards to secure the Internet of Space or the communication network that he will bring up to space. Now, when it comes to specifically the research of AI, at the moment, in terms of what's the state of the art, what's the current um, situation, in the most recent hacking conferences and security conferences, many researchers present both work on how to use adversarial AI. That means how to use AI and machine learning for attacks and to automate elements of the attack, but also how to fool, how to trick these systems. The current state of the art is that a lot of these, uh, what we call AI, are not general purpose AI. That means they're not supercomputers that you can bring any question to, any task to, and they will, you know, like in the movies, come up with the best uh, strategy. Rather, most of the current AIs are specific purpose-built systems. They are built either to win at a chess competition or a poker competition or to trade uh, in the stock exchange according to algorithms or to use cybersecurity mechanisms. These are specific purpose AIs. Until the day we see a true general purpose, largely built AI, I don't think it is going to be that dangerous as some people think. However, the I can guarantee you this topic is not just on the top of your mind or the top of Elon Musk's mind, but the best security researchers that I know, the, the bleeding edge of researchers are focusing right now on these two aspects. So it's not just about how to secure humanity from a dangerous AI, but also how to secure the, or learn about the use of AI for attacks, how you know, a nation state or a criminal organization can use AI tools, and how to prevent against the use of adversarial AI, how we can trick these AIs. So far, I've always seen the hackers are capable of outsmarting the machines. I hope that we pray that it continues to be like that. Thanks. I'm sure Eduardo has something about this, you know, because he deals with machines that kill all the time. No, really not. Killer robots. <laughs> no, I'm actually with the therapeutic robots. Um, no, but uh, no, what I wanted to say here is that I hear a lot about this super intelligence and also um, AI that is going to surpass our human capabilities. And I always think about, there's um, uh, a very interesting philosopher. It is called uh, Zygmunt Bauman. And he talks about the concept of uh, liquidity. And in his book about liquid love, uh, it, there's a very short sentence that says, the more time we spend in the virtual type of proximity, the less we are spending in learning the capabilities that the other non-virtual type of reality requires. So what I'm trying to say with this is that at the end of the day, we, we may try to translate the responsibility to machines or, um, uh, yeah, or to other systems, but actually like, we have a great responsibility on whether that happens or not. So the more you do things that they are not organic, the more time you spend in your computer, the more your time you spend this, and the less you are doing other stuff that are connected to human nature, maybe, that is in the, the moment where you really are like um, uh, separating yourself from your uh, true nature and like then developing like these um, problems. And well, and I can go on and on with this, but I just like wanted to make that quick point um, and that's it. Thanks, anybody else want to respond to that? Yep, a bit. Yeah. Uh, 
in Russian. If you, uh, на самом деле такая история интересная. Actually, this is a very interesting subject because you know AI, you know, in your opinion, is another automation point, the next stage of automation of our humankind, and now. From the applied uh, practices, uh, from all the information sources, for example, 2002, the year 2002, 500 viruses per day, and uh, basically, a, you know, a human is defending himself from another human who is a hacker, and uh, one side is making a virus, the other side is making some security protocol. So basically, it's a human versus human type. Now, we got. 300,000 uh, new malware. So of course, it's impossible for humans to write all of those. So it's a conveyor belt. So the matrix, the AI matrix of uh, making these uh, viruses like terminated type scenario exists. On one side, the robots uh, that uh, wrote some, uh, you know, some malware that are attacking companies in automated mode, more or less. On the other hand, on the other side of this issue, we don't, we don't, we don't have uh, this uh, human kind capacity we would have to you know the higher the half a population of china to combat all the viruses ourselves manually so that is why it's uh, basically ai versus ai but what's next of course uh, we engage machine learning and we are using it uh, already in all industries of informational security and again machine learning what's interesting about us what's cool because we see the result that algorithm made the solution that this file is corrupt. This file is, uh, you know, written with viruses. But this algorithm cannot explain to you why he made this decision. This is a peculiarity of this machine learning stuff. With AI, it's going to be practically the same. So the next stage, you know, the start of, uh, you know, AI helping us, making attacks and uh, re reflecting these attacks and finding these attacks, and then the same can be, you know, uh, can be done on an automated basis, and it's going to be just uh, you know some funny random fight of AI versus AI. That's our future. Two points to respond to that. Uh, I think we need to be specific on this. I don't think that the current state of the art in virus creation and malware, you know, including code polymorphism and the evolution of malware. We are not in a situation where there is an, a Skynet, an actual network of computers that are writing those viruses. Humans are writing those viruses and those algorithms, and they're building into those viruses mechanisms for the virus to rewrite itself in a new way. This is what's known as malware polymorphism. It's, it's a human trick. It's not an AI. So that's an important point. And secondly, to your second point, yes, I agree with you. We're going to see more usage of algorithms and machine learning. Already today, security researchers, security companies could not do their job if it weren't for the adoption of massive, massive uh, machine learning, specific purpose AI, and uh, analytics, etc. cetera. Uh, to the point that you made, which I think is very important, that these algorithms cannot explain to us why they made a specific choice. I believe that's another area of expertise where we're going to need more humans. We're going to need algorithm researchers, algorithm hackers, algorithm analyzers, people that can look at a machine or a process or an AI or an algorithm and say, okay, I can reverse engineer it in the same way that hackers and security researchers reverse engineer a program and uncover why did this algorithm make this decision? Why did Uber make me pay x times five and not x times 4.8 in a specific time of day, you know, for example? Today, many of these algorithms that already rule our lives in many ways, to most of us working outside the companies that make these algorithms, most of us, these algorithms are black boxes. So I'm hopeful we're actually going to see the rise of a new type of hacker, the algorithm hacker or the uh, algorithmic auditor as my sister in her recent research re referred to it, algorithmic aud auditors are going to be uh, needed. So that's another profession for the future, not just cybersecurity. And if I just can very quick, I think that you need to say that more louder and louder to the main European institutions to say that there is always a person uh, behind that. There is, uh, that's a human trick, that's a human. Uh, because there's all this discussion right now, European level, whether there should be this um, electronic personality. 
which is it can really be very dangerous, like trying to drive this responsibility for, to the algorithm, and and that is very important. And then the other aspect, it's also very very true. There is this ongoing discussion also in the right to explanation. That is not really uh, an enforceable right because it is placed in um, in a in a recital in the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. But we are just writing now an, an article with some colleagues, and actually we're trying to to say that yes, that there is such a right, like that it is um, derived from the main text. And and actually this year at um, Human Robot uh, Interaction uh, Conference. Uh, Marcia de Graaf and other uh, researchers uh, had a workshop called Explainable Robotics. So actually, like, there's a lot of research also on how to make the, um, the, the actions of the robots much more intelligible for people. But this actually, like, it's just another manifestation of this transparency requirement on like, how we want to know exactly what happened. Because, yeah, we should know, right? I have a question to our guys from Kaspersky Lab. So, you have an issue of, uh, you know, swaying the public opinion. So, I don't think that AI can help you in this because you are going to need uh, human intellect to do this job. This problem has actually been solved. We can share this with you. We are representatives of uh, Linguistics University, but on a mutual basis, of course. Do you have any sort of division that, uh, for example, we have a uh, digitalization of our humanitarian sciences, but we have uh, big problems with our teacher staff? If you have any plans opening up uh, initiatives of uh, digitalization of uh, your humanitarian uh, relations because I think this is actu actual necessity for you because you have problems with manipulating public opinions. How do you think? Would you like to partner up? Because I think it would be mutually beneficial. Thank you for the question. Okay, look, this is a tricky one. We are a tech company, so first and foremost, uh, we are not interested in humanitarian sciences. We are interested in hard sciences. It just so happens like this. When we're making steps towards this, we have our own school. Last year, we opened up uh, special courses uh, in various uh, public schools, uh, and now it is ongoing with some... Uh, specific universities but from humanitarian points of view from humanitarian liberal arts we haven't uh, you know have any sort of concrete initiatives this is an interesting proposition but i can't tell you anything uh, for of the drop of the hat i don't know how to prepare you know people from liberal arts or humanitarian sciences uh, to learn how to work with ai that's 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 not a that's not an easy qu question to answer but i think it can be solved so thank you i'm going to think about this кстати, я знаю одну компанию, которая проделала похожую штуку. Airbnb, большая компания. Они... Airbnb, I heard this, they had a growing need for data scientists. And they couldn't find enough data scientists. Not security specialists, rather, but data scientists. However, they had a very big legal department in their business. A lot of lawyers. And some of these lawyers that are very well read and that can read a contract and identify the bug in the contract, identify the problem, the loophole, uh, some of these lawyers wanted a job change. So they trained the lawyers to become data scientists. And for that specific company, it was a very significant effort. I think in the future, as we think about digital transformation, we're going to need new types of jobs. And we're definitely going to have, you know, people are not going to have the same career, the same job for their entire lifespan, especially as lifespans become longer. So we are going to have to think completely differently about the skill sets, the human skill sets that are required to work with technology and the different backgrounds, whether it is the liberal arts, the humanities, or the hard sciences, as Yuri says. I don't personally believe in the hard sciences versus the soft sciences. I think we need all types of sciences. Uh, Tel Aviv University, our center is by default an interdisciplinary center because of this. This is why we work together with the math or the mathematics and engineering faculties, the business administration faculty, the international relations schools, the political sciences, etc. That's my personal point of view, and I think uh, we're going to need more of those in, in the future.
And I agree, actually. And um, actually, um, linguistics department could be very, very important in, in the definitional task. Actually, there's a huge discussion on what does robot mean, for instance. European Parliament says that we need a definition. European Commission says that we do not need a definition. And in our work at the University of Queen Mary in London, actually what we say is that if we need to regulate such technology, we should have a definition. So linguistic people are actually like a very good fit on that and developing ontologies and different um, systems to understand what actually mean all these different words in different domains. So yeah, I think that that is a, a good uh, point that, um, that uh, man from the audience. Uh, Thank raised. you to the gentleman from yes. the linguistics department in the university. Spasiva. Spasiva Bolshoya. Spasiva Bolshoya. Pajasta. Good afternoon. I have a question of a legal essence. In a in practical sense. So now we have a amendment on informational law on Article 1503 that is related to extremism activity that will allow. General Attorney Office of the Russian Federation to block websites that has any information regarding some causes to concern of some extremism activity. To my mind, it can be also including hacking activity that uh, can uh, make sure that some information is sketchy of a gray area. So are there any practical mechanisms that will allow us first and foremost to protect company from uh, such information that can appear on this website. And also, if this information has already been appeared, we can prove that this information was not as a result of uh, activity of a company itself, but also as just a hacking activity. Thank you. Uh, система, да, как это все делается. У нас достаточно неплохо проработаны законы. В суде есть возможность доказать, что был взлом, есть возможность доказать, что собранные улики, цифровые улики принимаются. Но тут важный момент, важный момент, прям супер важный, это сбор, правильный сбор улик. Да, это как и в случае с обычным правоохранительным, любым правоохранительным делом, если улики собраны неправильно, то в суде они не имеют никакой силы. И вот важно просто компаниям а, подойти ответственно к информационной безопасности. Да, то есть суд не будет, ну, если вы ничего не сделали для защиты своего сайта, грубо говоря, то доказать, что это были хакеры, ну, тяжело. Потому что, например, не будет никаких логов, да, не с чем будет идти в суд. А если вы уже сделали какие-то шаги для защиты своего сайта, издания и так далее, то следующий шаг – это разработать, собственно, план того, что нужно делать в случае хакерской атаки. И если как бы, вы подойдете к этому ответственно, то, в принципе, никаких сложностей с доказательством в суде, что это был, были хакеры, не будет. Но тут важно действительно подготовиться заранее. То есть… Пытаться одновременно тушить пожар, а собирать а, улики не получится, я вам гарантирую. Сколько раз уже это проходили, важно подумать об этом заранее. Я бы хотела уточнить, что прокуратуре дается возможность блокировать сайты без суда. То есть это уже до суда дело может и не дойти. Может быть, есть какие-то превентивные меры, которые позволят вот на начальном этапе вот все это... Доказать. Вот как, какие конкретно, может быть, в Европе, в Америке есть уже некие прецеденты, которые, на основании которых можно э, и российскому бизнесу строить модель отношений? Наверное, международные коллеги могут подсказать, именно по международному поводу. Но, как я понимаю, именно первая, первая стадия – это защита своего бизнеса. То есть сделать так, чтобы хакерам было тяжело взломать сайт, чтобы это не было проходным, проходным двором, да, что это как бы, любой школьник может делать. Тогда уже начинаем какой-то серьезный разговор, аргументированный. И всегда, ну, обычно все такие вещи решаются в суде. Да, то есть блокировка, разблокировка и так далее. 
Should I reply? If you'd I'm, like. I'm not an expert on this particular law, which is a, which is a. Тому закону. Я себя слышу на русском языке сейчас. Перевод. Я не специалист по этому конкретному закону. На глобальном уровне есть тенденция, которая заключается в том, что изучая, есть, например, закон. And, but in my point of view, the reality is always going to be that whatever the legal law enforcement situation is, it is always going to be between five, three or five years in the good case, 10 or 15 years in the bad case, behind what is already the reality of what attacks are, are doing. So um, I'm, I'm not sure if that's, that's not very positive. Again, I don't think we can turn to law enforcement uh, in the hopes of getting better protection in this particular space. I do believe more we should in invest in our own prevention of attacks to begin with, or identification, identifying, like I mentioned earlier, the immune system. So identifying the antibodies to the uh, negative activity so that we can stop it before something really bad happens. Thank you. I try to reply, although I don't know this particular law. Thank you. Yeah. Ivor? Dear friends, do you have any more questions? We don't have any more questions. Ну что ж, мы уже, к сожалению, злоупотребили нашим временем. Я хочу поблагодарить наших экспертов. Дмитрий Самачев, from Bizone, Karen Elazare, Edward Fox Villaronga, Vasily Lukinik, Maria Varonova, Yuri Namistakov, I apologize. Uh, from Kaspersky. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you to you guys for coming and thanks to our host Strelka, to Binary District and indeed to Vostok. Cheers guys. Thank you. Thank you all.